actually. I got myself reading this interesting paper by a misguided political theorist. And in there it said something to the sorts of, fuck plants, I'm more interested in people. And so, that man was the person you saw fit to elect as your president, Mr. Spencer Hess. And so tonight we're going to say, fuck plants. And have a brief chat about things I find interesting. All right. All right, so this is mainly broken down into two things, the Titanic and airports, and we'll discuss why I find them interesting first. So Titanic, that got started when I was four. I watched the movie. I like to think everyone here has seen it. And I thought it was an interesting story about a ship, and it was kind of cool. And it set me on an interesting course of events that eventually took me out to the very site that Titanic sank, that was taken a hundred years to the second it went down. Hmm. So two and a half miles below my feet was the Titanic. Now airports, on the other hand, started with when I was younger, my family had a plane. And naturally being the curious boy I was, I wanted to learn how to fly it, which wound up being a good thing because my mom always swore that if my dad had a heart attack and died, she would not touch the controls. She would just let us all die. <laughs> so. I started learning to fly this contraption. Sorry, it's blurry. It's a small image. And uh, when I was taking my flight lessons, I noticed that all these airports I was going to, you know, they all have the same things, runways, terminal buildings, hangars, but they all look different. And I was intrigued about why they were different. So that's airports. So anyway, back to where we started. This is the South Pole. People did not reach that until 1911. And speaking of first in 1911, this is not the Titanic, in case you're thinking that. It is its sister ship, the Olympic. Hmm. Now, I'm, the main Titanic thing we're going to talk about is a conspiracy theory Kendall wanted me to address. And so we're going to talk about the differences between these two ships. If you look at the Olympic, this portion right here is a deck, and its promenade is open for everyone to be cold in the North Atlantic. On the Titanic, it is enclosed. That is the main way you can tell the difference between the two ships. Yes, we will revisit this. So the conspiracy theory starts early in the Olympics career. It was leaving Southampton, England, when the suction from its propellers pulled in a British naval vessel called the HMS Hawk, and it created this lovely gash that we see. And it also created a gash below the waterline. It flooded a couple watertight compartments in Olympic, but it was able to limp back to Southampton, get patched up. There's another picture of it. And uh, they sent it back to Belfast, which is where it was built, to get fixed. And instead of having these two ships being, you know, idle for a while, they just pulled parts from Titanic that were already done. Like it had a twisted propeller shaft, so they just ripped it from Titanic and put it in Olympic. So this is the Hawk. It uh, didn't fare as well as Olympic. But here are the two ships side by side. It's kind of hard, but Olympic, you can kind of see that is open. And on Titanic, they're building it nice and enclosed. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. What's happening right now? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just debunking a conspiracy theory. Anyway, <laughs> ships are given this thing called a yard number. It's essentially like the serial number of the ship. And uh, it's the number of ships that this yard has built. So Olympic was 400 and Titanic was 401. And they stamp these numbers all over the place on these ships so you can like identify them. But with Titanic two and a half miles underwater for a long time, we couldn't do anything about it. So. People thought that when the Titanic sank, it sank in one piece. That was the official record. And they also thought that below a certain depth in the ocean, all the oxygen would get squeezed out, so it would just be a giant dead zone. So they thought it was just going to look like this, a very Cinderella-esque idea. Hmm. Clearly that's not the case. So once we finally discovered the Titanic in 1985, 73 years after it went down, this is the stern of it. We were like, all right, let's debunk this crazy conspiracy theory. So, one of the ship's three propellers is still visible, and if you look really close on it, you can see the number 401 stamped into it. Therefore, it is indeed the Titanic. Another area of how we can tell that, yes, it is the Titanic is, look, a deck is indeed enclosed. 
down. Ni 98 years after being under the water, and that has still not rotted away. So. So how do you take a picture like that? Uh, so that is like multiple images that were taken, <laughs> and then they just like stitched it together. So you're saying it could be Photoshop? <laughs> <laughs> if we were not in polite company, I would say something about Photoshop. <laughs> anyway. So let's explore the rest of the wreck of Titanic while we're here. If you think the bow's in bad shape, which is the front, the back, the stern, didn't fare as well. This is the stern from above, and if you look on the far right, you can see these weird and kind of oval racetrack shaped things. Those are the tops of the ship's engines. Those are essentially giant piston engines, and that's what drove the ship through the Atlantic. Um, it's, they're officially called triple expansion reciprocating engines. They were the largest engines of that type ever built because not long after Titanic sailed, they came up with turbines, which are much more fuel efficient and powerful. So looking at the bow from above, we can see that it's rotting away. You know, this is all collapsing and there's holes opening up, which that's a lot in part due to us exploring the ship. You know, when subs go down to Titanic, they don't sit on the ocean floor. They land on the ship's deck, which is a dodgy thing when you're on this rotted out hundred year old hunk of iron. But this is the ship when we first found it. Much more intact, the mast wasn't broken, the little crow's nest was still there. But anyway, what are all these pieces of junk on the ocean floor? Is it just rusting iron, or does it tell a story about a human tragedy? So this is a sonar... Thank you. <laughs> this is a sonar image that they took just over the course of like a couple months photographing the whole wreck site. And this is finally how we determined how Titanic sank. It's like a gigantic crime scene. And what it tells us is like where the ship broke apart on the surface, the boilers were then exposed and they just fell straight down like rocks and they are in here. So that is like actually where the ship sank at. The bow was still hydrodynamic, so it just sailed away, which is why it's so much further on. And if you look at the stern section, which is this hunk of crap, you can kind of see there's like a whooshing effect swirling in. That's because as it sank, the rudder jammed over and it just went round and round, flinging chunks off, which are all those pieces above it that you see. So continuing to think about that this was a ship people were actually on, this is the remains of the cooling room of the Turkish bath. It's hard to think that after 90 some years of being under the ocean, it still looks like this. Hmm. Nice little oasis of beauty in the midst of disaster. So this is the Olympics cooling room. No pictures were taken of Titanic, so this is kind of what it looked like, except it didn't have windows because it was further inside. So what does that mean, cooling room? Where you just cool down after being in the steam room or in this ridiculous contraption called the electric bath. They were all into shocking you back in 1912. <laughs> they thought it had like good healing qualities. <laughs> so anyway, going back to the movie Titanic, you might remember there's this room that Jack and Rose are in where he draws her. This, that room was based off of one on real life. Here it is underwater, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, this is what the room <laughs> looks like when it was a room. Um, outside of the ship, though, we can see some interesting artifacts, like the head of a doll, a little Ooh. creepy, <laughs> or a pair of shoes. And what's creepy to me about this is you can tell that those were attached to a person that sank down, mm -hmm. their body dissolved away, and so th that's like that guy's only grave marker. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Titanic is rotting at a pretty alarming rate. Probably another 20 years from now it's going to collapse in on itself. And within another hundred years, it'll just be nothing but like an orange stain on the ocean floor. Pretend that's orange. I couldn't find any pictures of that. <laughs> so anyway, enough about Titanic. This is a picture of my cat, Lewis. And this is a picture of Rudolf Hess, a chief Nazi who, you know, Hess makes me wonder if there's any other sympathizers in this room. Wow. So anyway, moving into airports now. This is a picture <laughs> of a British Airways 747. <laughs> British Airways is the chief, well, a chief rival to Virgin Atlantic, which is the travesty airline of Sir Richard Branson, <laughs> of whom Naomi Klein, a noted political theorist, 
would call a green billionaire of whom cannot save us. <laughs> Don't you just love this picture of me? <laughs> what is the context behind that quote? <laughs> You, this is Farm Club, and I associate it with hippies. <laughs> anyway, airports originally started off as just a grass landing field. When you're flying, you want to take off and land going into the wind, so if you just have a big rectangle or whatever this shape is, just point your plane in the direction of the wind and go. But the problem with grass is when you get go on it too much, it dies. And then you know mud happens, and that's bad news bears for airplanes. So we decided to slap down some concrete because that's cleaner. Um, this is a very early picture of the old airport in Austin. It's no longer a thing. They closed it in 98. But the thing about putting down concrete is you always want more. And eventually you want more. And so that's how big the airport got before they closed it. It's just a giant <coughs> neighborhood now. But uh, other fun airports we can look at. Stapleton International. It was the old Denver airport serving until 1995. That this was its humble beginnings, just a small building, a couple hangars, and a large dirt field of which you could take off and land in any way. But again, mud was an issue, so we are like, hmm, let's slap down some concrete, or in this case, asphalt, because that's cleaner. And they decided to put down more. Eventually, you know, it got its own modern terminal building. Things were on the up and up until it expanded out to this point, as seen in 1993. The airport encompassed a total of 4,700 acres, but it still just wasn't enough. The runways were too close, they were too short, Denver was growing into it. So they decided that they would close it, and this is what it looks like kind of today. That's maybe a year old or so. So this is the new Denver airport, and this is a swastika. Some people say that these two look alike. I disagree. And if you think it kind of looks like this now, this is the master plan for Denver, and that's what it will look like when it is totally built out. Definitely not a swastika, so there's nothing to have a conspiracy theory about. Why do you, why do you disagree? I want to hear your argument disagreement. So a swastika, first of all, notice how this is you rotated keep quiet, 45 keep quiet, degrees. <laughs> yes, we will keep going back and forth. I see it now. I should have turned it back. So weird. So what is the design reason for why it's taking that shape? That's a great question. That does look a little bit like a swastika. It does not look like a swastika. <laughs> you will make you flick back and forth. <laughs> so anyway, you want, so like I said, you want to take off and land going into the winds. Well, sometimes Sometimes they're out in different directions. So you want to have a primary runway and a crosswind runway. And so the north-south ones are the primary, the east-west are the crosswinds. Thing is the airport's so busy though that you need more than one runway going and you have to have them spaced out because you don't want planes landing and taking off too close mm -hmm. to each other. Mm -hmm. So yeah, parallel runways are a very special and important thing which we can see they want a lot of. So you're saying it's kind of a practical reason it kind of looks like a swastika. <laughs> it kind of doesn't look like There's a swastika. There's a function they're, behind They're trying to get peace in the airport. Exactly. So anyway, we're going to take a look at some airports now, but we'll first understand the different types we have in this country. So they are divided up by their airspace class. There's no such thing as a Class A airport, because Class A airspace exists from 18,000 to 60,000 feet. We don't have floating airports, so I don't have that. Class Bs, then, are your busiest airports in the country. So O'Hare, Dallas, Fort Worth, insert busy city here. Class Cs are relatively busy, but not as bad, like Wichita would be an example of one. Class D means congratulations, you're busy enough to have a tower, but that's about it. Manhattan is an example of that. And then a Class E airport, which just has nothing, would be like my wonderful hometown of Dodge City. We're very special and don't count. So anyway, we'll have a lightning round of fun airports that we can look at. Starting with Class Bs. This is an example of a Class B airspace. So this is San Francisco, Dallas-Fort Worth, Chicago O'Hare, Detroit, JFK, Boston, Cincinnati, Kansas City, for you people that are from there. Huh. Houston, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Seattle, I know some Farm Club people went there, Memphis, Tampa, Mary's not here, but she should be, Orlando, Miami, Los Angeles, Washington, Dulles, Washington, Reagan, Atlanta, of which is the busiest airport in the world, fun fact, and Dallas Love. 
So then we'll look at some Class C's. This is what the airspace of a Class C airport looks like. Goes out 10 miles, it's nothing too special. This is Wichita. What do the circles mean? So remember in the picture we had quite a few slides back how they were like an upside down wedding cake? Yeah. So the rings just go up and out. It's kind of into like direct flights in and out, you know, because you're coming in at an angle. It's a 3D space, so it's yeah. like vertical height. Yeah, and so, outward. yeah, and when you're talking to like Wichita Tower, you're only going to be inside of this ring. This ring then is uh, controlled by either your approach or departure oh, frequencies. Gotcha. And yeah, they're not that fun to talk to, nor are they very pleasant. But anyway, so this is Wichita. <laughs> Notice how it's not as developed as our Class B's, but still pretty developed. Here's Omaha, Indianapolis, Albuquerque. Nashville, which I think should be a Class B, and Greenville, Greensville, is that it? South Carolina? Greenville. Yes, Greenville, Greenville Spartanburg. Yep. <laughs> Aaron's hometown. And oh, Moline, Greenville. Illinois, a very crappy airport because its runways intersect at one spot. What would you do if someone crashed right there, Lori? You'd shut your airport I down and you'd I be left screwed. I a long time ago and there's proof. <laughs> Where in Illinois? <laughs> Moline. So Class D wow. then just gets the one ring, which just means you're only talking to the tower. This is Garden City's Class D airspace. Here's Manhattan Airport. Not quite as much to shake a stick at. But if we really don't want to shake a stick, let's look at a Class E airport like Dodge. And It's not a Class E airport, but... C L A S S space E, oh, not the other wow. classy. I know, fun with words, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing to write home about. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, then U.S. airports are by far the best in the world, but we'll take at least airfield-wise. But we'll take a look at a few other international ones. So this is London Heathrow. Some people hate it. London Gatwick, London Stansted, London. Mm -hmm. Well, is that Luton, London City, London Southend? Those six airports make up the busiest airport system in the world. Hmm. Fun fact. This is Singapore. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So history of airports. We can trace it back to a number of places, but we'll start here at Croydon. This was the original London airport. It closed not long after World War II because London grew into it. Um, very important thing about this was in April set or on April 7th 1922 there was two planes trying to land at the airport and at the time we didn't really have radar or any sort of navigation so pilots would look over the side and follow the road to the airport well when two people are looking over the side and not ahead of them boom so the British being the very wise society that they are decided hmm we should fix that and that's what gave birth to the tower, which this is the Croydon's tower. It's much more humble than the gigantic things like this today. This is at JFK. Um, in 1930, then, we got the invention of airfield lighting. This is a modern runway. This is not a 1930 runway. Cleveland was the first airport to give us lights. And their idea to do that was get burning drums of oil on the side of the runway. <laughs> <laughs> Very environmentally friendly. Not dangerous at all. Not dangerous yeah. at all. Another improvement that came in the 30s with this was the advent of the terminal building. This is no longer in use. I think it's a restaurant now, but it's at London Gatwick Airport. It's called the Beehive. I don't know. I guess I think it looks like a beehive. But one interesting thing that it had that we wouldn't see again until the 60s was it a covered walkway that would take you out to your plane. Like, they would telescope in and out. Pretty neat invention. So, yeah, this wouldn't be seen again for a while. Instead, we would just take an air stair into our plane, which, you know, hope it's not cold or raining. Some airports tried to fix this. Like, in 1960, Pan Am opened the world port with this gigantic roof, but we decided that was too complex, so we just came up with the jet bridge, which we all know and love today. So as air travel became more of a thing that not just the rich and famous could have, the old Art Deco terminals like this at Liverpool, of which is now named after John Lennon, and also Berlin's airport, gave way to these ridiculous finger pier terminals. That way, you know, you could have planes line up <laughs> further. The problem with finger piers is you get ridiculous things like this. This is the old terminal at Dallas Love. <laughs> And, you know, imagine that nightmare of, you know, you're connecting flight and you're going to have to run a mile to get to your plane. 
So the designers of this terminal were like, huh, this could be an issue. So they came up with this interesting thing called the moving walkway. This is not the original one. Uh, the original one was more of like a rubber conveyor belt, like what you see at the checkout lane at Walmart. <laughs> and it also had like a really big gap where it went back under. The problem with that is an inattentive toddler, a few months after it opened, got sucked under and killed. So they had to kind of fix that. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> propeller planes, you know, gave birth to the finger pier terminal. This is the old terminal at Pittsburgh. The problem with these things is they're hard to expand once you've already gone in this direction. When Pittsburgh thought they needed to expand, they added in this extra corridor that you see down on the bottom right of the terminal. Imagine walking to your flight. I don't think so. So the jet age then came in. This is the 1961 terminal of Atlanta. It has an interesting architectural style. This is it from above. It's, it too has the finger pier design, but you're not really running miles. It, all kind of connects back into the terminal at one point. Uh, we talked about Austin's old airport. This is what its terminal looks like. The tower is still standing. That's all that's there. Uh, this is the old JFK TWA flight center. And this is then the terminal at Washington Dulles. This is the only uh, air, air terminal of the Jet H terminals that still exists because they just aren't very expansion friendly. So anyway, after we were like, okay, this isn't practical, We'll go with a nice utilitarian design. We got something like this, which is the new and current terminal at Atlanta. And this is when we then got the long, boring hallways with gray carpet, fluorescent lighting, no windows, no fun, no heart. And they're in pretty bad shape today. This is at LaGuardia, but their roof just leaks all the time, so they have to section off parts of it so the water can't get in. But don't worry, not all airports are like this. At Singapore, you get something like this. This is their indoor butterfly garden because who doesn't want to look at butterflies while waiting for their flight? Or if <laughs> butterflies aren't for you, you can take a dip in the pool. <laughs> and again, if you're not one who's inclined to swim, they're building a new mall at the airport. This is going to open in 2018. This is what it'll look like. This is how you miss your flight. <laughs> this is how you miss your flight. Go have fun and do things. Well, the interesting thing about Singapore is people in, will like just go have a day at the airport. They don't even have a flight. They'll just go there. So, yeah, exactly. You know, this is your baggage claim. Much more inspiring than your typical U.S. airport. Or, hmm, I'll just wait over here for my flight, they say. So U.S. airports are trying to catch up, but... We still aren't having quite the nice amenities that we would like. You know, we're, we finally got the idea that windows are good and light is fun. So this is the new terminal they're building at New Orleans. It's going to open in 2018. Newark also got the idea, so they're going to build this sometime. They haven't decided when. And LaGuardia is indeed getting rid of their leaky roofs. And this will be their new thing. They're pretty much just tearing down the whole darn airport and trying again, which they should do. Um, Salt Lake City also got the idea, and this is kind of what they're going to do. Again, it's not indoor butterfly garden material, but it is a start. And that's my slideshow. Right. Wow.